Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Greg Smith, as she said. I was a pediatrician, and I wanted to say right off the bat, I'm not an expert in Lyme disease. I'm not an expert in Morgellons. I was a damn good pediatrician, but I'm not an expert in any of this. And I want to tell you a little joke, because when I was in medical school, we considered an expert to be somebody from out of town who brings slides. So I don't have any PowerPoint or slides. I just want to talk a little bit about what happened at the beginning and where we are right now, where I hope we're going, mostly about the problems we're having and will have. I got sick in 2004 in May. I had lesions on my arms and a few other places, which were spreading. I had no idea what this insane thing was. I had all these sores, and this was weird, and, and they were itching, and they, there was this funky stuff in it. So I did what I think any reasonable person would do, is I tried to search out the information. So I went on the internet, and I found the Morgellons Research Foundation, Mary Lato, and it was the only thing that I found that seemed to be the least bit science-based. There was, but the thing that really got to me during this and made me very passionate were the stories. People who have been treated very poorly by physicians, people who are not even touched by the physician and they're diagnosed as being delusional, people whose other symptoms are ignored. And this made me very passionate. And began a conversation over the telephone with Cindy Casey and, and Charles Holtman. And we became very close friends and decided that the direction we wanted to go was a little different, so we formed our own 401c3. And I want to give Charles credit here, the credit is due. At that time, I was very sick, Cindy was very sick, and my wife at the time was very sick. The only reason we got anywhere or got anything done was Charles was the one who had some energy. He would literally drag us out of bed if we were at a hotel or whatever, hopefully to get us out before we were supposed to be charged an additional day. He did all of the paperwork to become a 401c3 foundation, a nonprofit, which we are. And it just about killed all of us when he passed away. But Cindy has carried on, and this is as a result. We actually had the first conference here. And Charles was here. He was in the Baptist Church a few miles down the street, which we had it for another couple of years. And I remember the first day was just exhausting. It was just about a half day. And I remember when we about the third one, we were still in the church, and I went upstairs to one of the Sunday school classes and took a nap at lunch because I was so exhausted. At that time, we had no idea what was the cause of this. We were looking, we were open, and there were about as many different theories available on the Internet as there were people out there publishing stuff. But none of it made sense, and none of it was backed up with any science. And so we started this foundation. And one of the things that was from the very beginning our goal was it will be nothing but scientifically accurate. And we're not going to deal with it unless it is based in science. And that's where we've tried to go. We've also dedicated that of the research, of the funds that we get, at least half of everything that we get would go to research. Now, I don't know what the numbers are, okay, but that was our theoretical, and we have given and supported a lot of research, and it's because of the generous donations of many of you and of many other people. Uh, I was lucky. I was diagnosed, I actually pretty much diagnosed myself with the help of a lot of tests that my doctor ordered to rule out a bunch of other stuff. And when I had had some laboratory work, I got in contact with Bill Harvey, who was still alive at that time. He was practicing in Colorado Springs. 
and I saw him in consultation and he started me on the antibiotics and I, my doctor at home worked with him and I, I was in consultation once a month with Dr. Harvey and antibiotics were changed around and basically I spent about a year and a half on antibiotics, the first four months were IV. And I did a typical Herxheimer reaction in January and February of 2006 was when I started treatment was in, in December of 05. Their blur, I have many, many days that I have no memory of. I slept constantly, and which was, I was doing that anyway before. But I was lucky, and very slowly during that period of time, I began to improve. And it took several years after I stopped taking the antibiotics before I started begin to feel a semblance of my normal self. Over the last four or five years, I have been pretty good. And I have more energy and I, I have no lesions. So I consider myself very lucky. And what I do want to do is, is emphasize that when we started this foundation, we didn't know anything. We did not know the cause or whatever. We have had research now that definitively shows that spirochetes are present, Borrelia burgdorferi, other Borrelia species, probably it's probably a co-infection in the skin. I mean, we've got hard data. So we know, we know something else even more important. Those patients who have Morgellons, who have had treatment for Lyme, aggressive treatment, have either gotten well or gotten better. I'm an example of that. Cindy Casey is an example of that. Others around, okay? Some people have to continue to be on antibiotics, possibly even the rest of their life. Others are fortunate like me and, and get off of them. So I want this to be a message of hope to all of you because we do know so much more now than we did just a few years ago. However, as has already been discussed here, the future is going to be where our challenge is now. We need more research and we need confirmation of our pre previous research and we need better treatment protocols for treatment of Lyme. This is all coming along. However, one of the biggest problems we have right now is the CDC. The CDC is an organization that I respect. I think most doctors feel that way or have felt that way. We follow their guidance. Because in, when you're practicing medicine in a busy practice, you try real hard to keep up, but it's hard. And so there are times when you rely on the experts. And the CDC is supposed to be the expert. And as you know, they, if, you, if you don't know this, you should know it. They really bungled HIV in the early 80s. And they really blew that one, just like they have blown Morgellons and Lyme. And Sadly, more and more, I believe that the CDC has become politicized, and we got to consider there are huge things, huge forces here at work. The insurance industry. If we, if medicine all of a sudden recognizes that chronic Lyme disease is a real entity, well, gee whiz, then the insurance company is going to have to pay for all them antibiotics and all that treatment. And that's a powerful lobby. Uh, I've heard that in the insurance industry and in, in, in pharmaceutical industry, there are averages about six lobbyists for every congressperson. And there's huge amounts of money that are involved. I think that's, a, that's an issue right there. Uh, we also have bad tests. I mean, the tests that are used, the screening tests, CDC has not made any new recommendations about testing. So we, as doctors who are practicing, you know, we do what the CDC says is the right thing to do, so we sort of that test. And as you've heard, and which is true, the t commonly used tests are not sensitive enough, and they, don't, they miss about half of the patients, maybe more. The sad thing, and it's true, but this is the way doctors think. Even though the CDC and, and everybody else that writes about Lyme disease does admit that it is a clinical diagnosis. That means you've got to put this picture together. You get 
certain laboratory tests that maybe confirm it, but you don't have any specific tests that absolutely diagnoses it. Unfortunately, as doctors in practice, we tend to think about, okay, a negative test, we're good, let's go on to the next patient, we're going to hurry. Without giving credence to, you know, well, wait a minute, simply because so far the CDC has not really given us better guidance. Um, I guess one of the things I want to talk just a minute about is the fact that uh, one of the problems as far as getting this recognized is <laughs> the patients. Did, did any of y'all remember the old uh, comic strip Pogo? I'm old, so I know it, okay? Pogo was an opossum who lived in the Okefenokee Swamp and sometimes came up with great philosophical thoughts. And one of those thoughts is, we have met the enemy, and it is us. Sometimes we do not present ourselves well to doctors. I mean, my God, the story itself makes any reasonable physician or reasonable person back off and think, hmm. And you know, there is disruption in the way the brain works as a result of this disease. Jim Swartz, who's a physician in Florida, who's written about this, about Lyme disease primarily, talks about the brain inflammation and all of the different sorts of behavioral issues that come as a result of that. I mean, personality changes, bipolar disease, new onset of ADHD. I mean, many different things that occur as a result of this inflammation. So guess what, folks? For a while, just about everybody with this gets a little crazy. I do know from talking to a lot of people and from my personal experience, initially, when you get the lesions, and they itch, and you look, and you, you pick, you almost, it is almost obsessive. And you can't stop picking, even though you know it's just damaging the skin, because it feels so much better when you get whatever that little thing is that you, got, you just got out. And boy, do you get some weird stuff out. As we've seen, the little specks and the fibers and so forth, that thank God we now know what they are. But this knowledge is not widely disseminated among physicians. Uh, we must, as patients and as family members and so forth, be advocates for the patients in our family. We must try to educate physicians we must actually have a paradigm shift. Do you all know what a paradigm shift is? It's a, it's a change, a huge change in the thought process about an issue, okay? Galileo is a great example of that. He was, he was put on house arrest for daring, for the rest of his life, for daring to state that the earth revolved around the sun rather than the vice versa, because everything at that time, according to the church, revolved around the earth. He didn't do well with that, and he shut up after a while, and that was good. We're not shutting up. We're going to continue to be loud and vocal, and we're going to continue to advocate. And the story that I want to end this with, which is, this is brief, but I want to talk. This story that's a true story from my junior medical school days, and it's an important thing. This was the first rotation as a junior medical student. When you go to medical school, you spend two years in a classroom. I mean, like, whoa. You see patients occasionally. But then the third and fourth years, you're seeing patients. As it happened, my first rotation was psychiatry. And I was there with some other guys in my class, uh, in girls. And uh, there, we were on psychiatry. So we were at the psychiatric unit in the local hospital, seeing patients and trying to learn a little bit about crazy people. <laughs> And there was this lady, a middle-aged white female, who today would, today her, uh, what she has would be called a panic disorder. She had panic attacks. And she was a frequent flyer. And she would come in, short of breath, chest pain, feeling of doom. And it was because she'd gone off her meds again. 
And they would put her back in and get her medicines going, give her some therapy. A few days later, send her back out. I mean, she's done this over and over. And, well, guess what? She's back. And they called from the outpatient screening area and said she was back. And she came on in. And then she was seen by the psychiatry intern then the psychiatry resident, and then the psychiatry attending. And, of course, last, the junior medical student. Well, when you're a junior medical student and you do a history and physical examination, you do it all, and you write it all down. You have to do this in order to prove that you know what all you're supposed to ask, and it's part of that learning process to get it all imprinted in your mind. Okay. So my friend, David Tucker, who's a ended up being a surgeon, went in and actually did a nice physical exam on this lady. And she was in severe congestive heart failure. Junior medical student on his first rotation picked that up. She was transferred to the medical unit. And I understand she did quite well. There's more to that story that I learned and that I wish other doctors would learn. Even crazy people get sick. And even though we may act crazy, and we are pretty crazy sometimes, and we have behavioral issues from inflammation in our brain, we need to be taken seriously. And I fault doctors in general for not taking us seriously. This is, it's, I do not understand it. I have not understood it from the beginning. I do not understand the lack of curiosity, as we've talked about before. I don't understand the arrogance. But I've made this statement before, and I think it's true. When you become an expert in certain fields, the expert, you turn your damn mind off, your brain, okay? You are the go-to person, and you know it all. That's where we stand, folks. We have people like Feldman. My God in heaven. If he's never met a bad doctor or he doesn't know any bad doctors, he's not looked in the mirror recently. <laughs> there are good doctors, there are bad doctors, and there's a few very good doctors, okay? And we have to work with our doctors and we have to work with young medical students and young doctors to try to educate them because the paradigm shift that we're talking about. Thomas Kuhn has written a lot about this. And frankly, his conclusions that the paradigm shifts only really occur when the old experts die off. So this is where we are right now, and we have a challenge ahead of us as individuals. But we have so much more hope than I had and Cindy and the others of us who were in, in this had at the time. And at the time, we met some people who had had it for many, many years. And some of those passed away. Some of those lost contact with. Don't know what happened with them. But we do know enough now that each and every one of us should be able to educate your own doctor. Take the research in. If you, if you have a doctor that won't listen to you, find another doctor. And I, I really want to thank, too, just, just in closing... People who have been most influential, of course, Charles and Cindy. Randy, back there. Randy Wymore. Make no mistake, that man put his career on the line for us. He took a risk in supporting us and doing research on this that could have led to him not staying in academics very much and not being able to do research because it was such a controversial subject. And he's one of my heroes. But you all are my heroes because you're all trying and you're all working. And we're, all, we're all in this together and we're going to win.